Hi everybody, it's Professor Miller. This lecture is going to focus on alterations of the pulmonary system. Once again, before you move through some of the abnormals, briefly review the, you know, the structure and function of the pulmonary system or the general anatomy there. Um, just as a refresher, I know a lot of it, it's probably a review for you in terms of, you know, anatomy, but um, it does help when you put it in perspective of just how the airways are and how gas exchange occurs, essentially. It kind of helps you with the abnormals. Um, so just take a look through that when you have a moment. Um, so we'll take a look at some different um, pulmonary disorders. Um, much of them, you know, either are classified as a restrictive disease or obstructive disease, um, and we'll kind of separate them out. And once again, two other things like infections are a big um, area that we always think about with pulmonary as well. So when you're looking at signs and symptoms of pulmonary disease, obviously you've probably encountered a lot of these within the clinical setting. Um, things such as dyspnea, or sometimes you'll hear the term shortness of breath, that's the other term that we often use for it. Um, cough, tachypnea, um, which is obviously a fast um, breathing pattern. Hyperventilation, hypoventilation, hypercapnia, hypocapnia. Um, hemoptysis, which is basically um, coughing up blood. Abnormal sputum, cyanosis, pain, clubbing. Um, so really when you're thinking about these, or looking at some different disease states, try to think about which ones kind of coordinate with it or what you would see. And it's not uncommon to see, you know, a multitude of these across different disease states. So, you know, you really got to try to think about what you would tend to see it with more often. Um, and we'll kind of try to pull those out as we move through. Um, dyspnea, once again, um, is usually classified sometimes interchangeably as um, shortness of breath. Um, but really it's that sensation of uncomfortable breathing, um, really not being able to get enough air in and kind of struggling there. Um, so you do see dyspnea a lot with a lot of chronic pulmonary and acute pulmonary conditions. Orthopnea, which once again you probably heard of as well, this is when the patient's lying down. They tend to have more um, difficulty breathing. Um, and a lot of it too is because it could have increased pressure on that, um, the thoracic cavity essentially, and it you know, compresses it more. Um, a big one that you'll see this a lot is with those patients that have um, pulmonary edema or CHF, that they start to get fluid on the lungs. Um, sometimes you inquire about asking them, you know, do they have to sleep upright in a chair? Do they use multiple pillows to sleep? Um, it's not uncommon to see this with pulmonary disorders, and it's a good thing to always inquire about because it really can kind of help you gauge how severe, you know, the underlying disease is. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is very common with CHF as well, but with pulmonary edema, obviously, because we're talking about pulmonary. Um, what happens, obviously, these patients are, you know, sleeping, and they wake up gasping for air essentially in the middle of the night. And a lot of this is because of the fluid change or the fluid shift from the interstitial space. You know, a lot of patients have more edema in their lower legs with, um, when their legs are dependent during the day. So they go to lay down at night. A lot of this fluid starts to come off or the, you know, they get a buildup essentially too in their lungs. And they wake up essentially gasping for air. And it's a good indicator um, to show that they're not under good control. So if they're getting this, it's something, it's a red flag that we need to, you know, alter treatment or look at their management a little bit differently. Um, abnormal breathing, breathing patterns, obviously you've probably seen this in the inpatient setting. Um, Kussmaul's respirations or Shane Stokes respirations. Um, Kussmaul's is basically where they have um, an increased rate, but they tend to take a large tidal volume and then they have pauses or essentially a pause in between these periods where they have, um, you know, significant tidal volumes coming in. Where Shane Stokes basically is where they have alternating periods of these deep, but tend to be very shallow respiratory um, inspiration. And then they're followed by apnea with this as well. Um, so sometimes you'll see this at the end of life um, in patients, you know, that you might see in the inpatient setting essentially. I added this in terms of um, differential diagnosis in terms of chronic dyspnea. It's just to get your mind um, thinking about other areas that you really want to think about when a patient presents with shortness of breath. Because once again, you have to look at those other systems as well. And the other thing too is to think that pulmonary and cardiac definitely overlap. As you can tell when you talk about cardiac, obviously things like CHF can definitely affect um, gas exchange in the pulmonary system as well. Um, but even things too like the GI tract, neuromuscular disorders, or even other things that are more systemic, such as essentially like anemias. If you think about anemia, you have low circulating, um, well, your, your hemoglobin is basically um, low in these patients with anemia. So what happens is obviously they're not oxygenating well because of, you know, a low hemoglobin level. And it's not necessarily because they have a pulmonary disorder. 
it's because of anemia. So that's not uncommon to see dyspnea or shortness of breath with anemias. Um, but we do worry about ultimately that affecting their cardiovascular status because um, it puts a toll on the patient's heart. But really, so when you think about dyspnea, that's why it's important to look at those other symptoms. You know, do they have a productive cough with it? Do they have they had a fever with it? Um, you know, what's their social history? Do they smoke? Once again, it kind of helps me point you in the direction of whether it would be, you know, coming from their pulmonary system versus another system like your um, GI tract or your hematologic system, essentially. But these are just things to think about, like neuromuscular, um, ALS. You know, they can have um, an abnormality there with um, innervation, you know, or their muscles um, surrounding the thorax, essentially. So really, there's a lot of other areas that can definitely cause chronic dyspnea. So these are just to kind of get your mind thinking about other things that you really want to think about as well. Um, in terms of hypoventilation, these are just general terms, and I'm sure you're pretty well aware of these. Um, so I won't spend a ton of time on it, but I think you, you know, understand what hypoventilation is, is there's inadequate ventilation there essentially related to the metabolic demands. Um, so they may have a normal respiratory rate, but they're not, they have a low ventilation essentially. And this can lead to respiratory acidosis, which I'm sure you've all unfortunately have countered in um, the inpatient setting. And obviously, if they're not ventilating well, they don't have adequate um, alveolar ventilation, they can have hypoxemia. Um, whereas hyperventilation is obviously the opposite, where ventilation essentially ex exceeds metabolic demands. And this can re lead to respiratory alkalosis. So if you think back to like your basic ABGs and interpretation of them, remember when we talk about CO2 retention and blowing CO2 off, um, you know, with CO2 retention, they're at risk for acidosis. Um, and when they blow too much off, they're at risk for alkalosis. Because a lot of, remember, you think about your ABGs and all that, your gases and your pH is um, basically maintained um, by your, your respiratory um, system and your kidneys, essentially. They both work in concert. Um, the other thing, too, is we look at cough. Obviously, cough is a big presenting complaint from patients that you will definitely see. Um, your cough, basically, there's, it, there's multiple receptors that um, are transmitted centrally, essentially, um, through your vagus nerve. So a lot of the meds that we use actually can be mediated through this process. And a big one, if you think about it, is opiates. We use coding cough medicine a lot to suppress um, cough. Um, so this is just an example of how the whole process kind of um, occurs and what we can do to intervene there. Um, we do define cough in terms of length. Um, obviously, acute is, you know, a shorter time period, which typically resolves in like a two to three week period. So when you think of an acute cough, it tends to be more of an issue related to like an infection, whether it's a virus or a bacterial infection, um, something acute going on, obviously. And you want to look at those other signs and symptoms in the patient. Whereas a chronic cough, obviously, is very long lasting. It's usually greater than three weeks. You can see this from acute infections. A big one that you commonly will see this with is bronchitis. A lot of times bronchitis starts as a viral infection, but it's not uncommon for patients to have a cough for a month from it, unfortunately. Um, however, if it's persistent and they don't have you know, an underlying infection there, you do have to start thinking about other disease states that can cause a cough. And what other symptoms do these patients have you know, that can lead you to um, looking at a differential essentially with them? Hemoptysis is basically coughing up blood, um, bloody secretions. You can see this from anywhere from, unfortunately, you know, lung cancer or an underlying lung disease or um, a pulmonary embolism, or all the way to, you know, if a patient's, you know, been sick and they just have, um, you know, a minor little rupture of a tiny little vessel, you know, in their, their upper airway that they note. And sometimes it's just a small little vessel that ruptures, you know, and nothing concerning. But obviously, it can occur, you know, from the lower respiratory tract, too, as well. So you got to think about it from that perspective, too. Um, I did add this, and you'll get into this in your fu future clinical rotations as well in your other courses, but these are things you have to think about in cough. One big one in adults, if it's just this dry, hacky cough, it's we in there on blood pressure pills, is ACE inhibitors. It's not uncommon for patients um, to have this, unfortunately, as a side effect of an ACE inhibitor. Um, and it's usually, it's related to elevated levels of bradykinin, um, and they get this dry cough. But if you note, know, like, look at their history, where they just recently started on a blood pressure pill. Um, was it an ACE inhibitor? Because it can cause a dry cough. Do they have other symptoms that go along with it? Um, another one, obviously, is asthma. We, you know, do they have a cough that's non-infectious in nature? Is it worse 
um, at night? Or is it worse when they're exposed to allergens? Like you got to think about things like that. Another big one that you'll see a lot in adults is actually reflux, um, GERD. A lot of times patients have it at night and they don't honestly realize that they even have it. Well, what happens, obviously, you know, they have reflux at night and they actually kind of aspirate a little bit of it. And it's another common reason for um, a presentation of a chronic cough. Um, obviously, you see this more in adults, but you can see it in kids. So it's something to keep in your mind. Um, obviously, there's rare causes or less common causes, but you got to think things like COPD. Um, Post-infectious cough is actually fairly common. Um, things like TB is, a, you know, is the patient at high risk, you know, in terms of exposure. Um, and children, once again, it's kind of very similar. The big one in kids, the new year of a cough, is what we really worry about is asthma. So if, it, if it's a chronic cough, is it worse when they exercise? Is it worse when they're exposed to allergens? Um, is it worse when they go out in the cold? Those are just kind of symptoms, and we'll go through that when we talk about asthma. But once again, reflux is another one you got to think about. Big ones are upper or lower respiratory tract infections, and sometimes a cough can persist after that as well. Um, so these are just things to think about. I just figured I would add that. Um, I'm sure you know what cyanosis is. Um, obviously, it's that bluish discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes, um, and it's obviously related to a reduced amount of hemoglobin or desaturated hemoglobin. So remember when I mentioned before about anemia. You may be saturating or ventilating um, fine or perfusing fine, but you may be anemic and they have a reduced amount of hemoglobin. So they may be cyanotic. I mean, usually it's not that severe, but hopefully it's not. But um, when you think about things like anemia or acute blood loss, this is an exact mechanism of causing cyanosis. Um, or obviously it can be caused from pulmonary cardiac disorders that they have a desaturated hemoglobin at that point. Um, and really the other thing to think about too is it central versus peripheral. Remember central is basically, a lot of times you'll see changes at the mucous membranes like the lips. Um, um, in the oral cavity a lot of times you'll see that. Where peripheral is more peripheral, like you'll see it um, more commonly at the feet or the toes or the hands. Um, the central you tend to see more commonly with a systemic disorder like um, a heart defect or some kind of cardiac or pulmonary disorder. So obviously, you know, that's they're both concerning, but it's more concerning that, you know, that it's central. Um, in terms of hemoglobin, five grams of um, hemoglobin is desaturated regardless of concentration. So basically, you can have a reduced or um, desaturated hemoglobin, essentially. Um, but remember that it's an insensitive measure to disease because cyanosis, unfortunately, is a late stage finding. It's not going to be evident until there's severe hypoxemia. Um, but things like pulmonary, cardiac, um, just in, you know, exposure to cold or acute anxiety, um, anxiety, because you think about your sympathetic nervous system that kind of kicks in and you, you get shunting of your blood to your major organs. So sometimes you can, they may appear like their skin is, or their fingers are a little dusky at that point. Um, but these are just some overall, um, things, things to think about. I'm sure you might have seen this at some point too um, throughout your career, but we tend to see clubbing in patients that have um, chronic pulmonary or cardiac diseases. It's not uncommon to see this with a patient that has had a heart defect or a significant heart defect that um, they have shunting with, where what I mean by shunting essentially is they're, they have mixed um, saturated and unsaturated oxygen essentially going out to the periphery. And what happens from this chronic state of hypoxemia, the patient develops clubbing. And you'll see it in the fingers, and it's pretty characteristic. If it's severe enough, you'll definitely notice it. Um, but they tend to get that more rounded shape at the end of their um, fingers, essentially. And this is what we term clubbing. And I'm sure you've probably heard of this um, at some point. But you'll see it with chronic pulmonary disorders um, or even heart defects, potentially, too. It's usually long-standing, too, obviously. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, you know, it's a long-standing process, essentially, for developing. Um, other conditions that can be caused with pulmonary disease or injury, hypercapnia, which I'm sure you've all, of, um, you know, re heard about back when you think about um, undergrad pathophysiology. But with hypercapnia, there's an increased CO2. Um, so remember when you think about ABGs, we'll look at CO2 levels, the pH. Um, so it's in your arterial blood by um, hypoventilation of the alveoli. Um, a decreased drive to breathe or in, inadequate ability to respond to ventilator, ventilation or, um, or stimulation, essentially, or vent stimulation. Um, and it, really, when you think about it, this is why a lot of patients, when we have a mechanic, mechanical ventilator, we can control a lot of this um, in terms of, you know, how much CO2 they're blowing off and how um, well you can actually ventilate them. Unfortunately, in patients, you know, 
especially like an outpatient setting, you don't have the ability to do that. So a lot of these states, um, you know, like some of these chronic pulmonary states, they um, are CO2 retainers, unfortunately. So, you know, it becomes more chronic in nature at that point. Um, there's two different terms. We tend to use, um, um, you know, both of them. Unfortunately, they technically have two different meanings, but hypoxemia is really when it's related to a respiratory alteration where hypoxia can be related to other systems. So, you know, you can have hypoxia from, um, you know, drowning or something, unfortunately, like that, where you, I mean, that does affect your respiratory, but I think you get what I mean. But hypoxia, hypoxia can cause uh, or be caused from other systems, where hypoxemia is strictly related to respiratory alterations. Um, so really, there's an impairment in oxygen delivered to the alveoli, um, inspired air or hyperventilation. So either the amount coming in um, or there's a hypoventilation issue there. Or there could be diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli into the blood. So there can be a VQ mismatch. So that means that there's a ventilation perfusion, perfusion mismatch there that can cause it. And I'll explain it to you on the next slide. There's some images that kind of put it together. Um, perfusion of pulmonary capillaries, ventilation, perfusion abnormalities. This is a big one. Um, shunting is a common cause. So there can be inadequate ventilation of areas that are perfused well. Common ones are things like atelectasis, asthma, um, bronchoconstriction, or pulmonary. Um, actually, pulmonary edema, I would say, is more of a ventilation issue, which I'll explain in a minute. But when you look at ventilation, it's you're not getting good oxygenation or it, basically inflation of the alveoli, but you still have good perfusion there. So when you have a perfusion issue, a good example would be like a PE, where there's an embolism in there, and you don't you can't perfuse those um, areas by the alveoli because there's a, a blockage. And I'll show you on an image. Um, so really, like when you look at the top one, we say normal VQ. It's basically the ratio of ventilation. Um, with perfu perfusion, which is Q. Um, so you have your, from your pulmonary artery, and basically you have the vasculature here, and then you have your airway with the alveoli, essentially, is what this is. And this is normal. So you should have good ventilation. So you have, you know, this wide opening here where you have air coming through. And you should also have good perfusion. So you want, obviously, this is where gas exchange occurs. So you want both of those mechanisms to be working efficiently so you have good ventilation and good perfusion. So that's because obviously you need both in order to have, um, you know, properly saturated hemoglobin to be going out to the tissues, essentially. Now, an example here, like if you had a low ventilation to perfusion, this would be like a mismatch. You have, this is an example of like COPD. If you have impaired ventilation, so this is once again, like coming down to your alveoli, this is where, you know, the air should be filling it up. Well, there's a plug there, a mucus plug. So you're not getting good ventilation, but you still have normal perfusion. Well, what happens still, obviously, if you're perfusing, but you don't have good ventilation, it's still going to affect, you know, your um, saturation of your hemoglobin, and you're going to end up with hypoxemia. Or you can have a shunt. Now, this kind of, it gets a little bit more confusing. So they have, like, a very low VQ. So right here, there's completely, like, in this area, there's a completely blocked area. And the alveoli is essentially collapsed. So once again, you still have normal perfusion coming from here or hitting this one, but this one's blocked. So this one is not getting, um, the blood's not getting oxygenated here. So it's sending out partially mixed saturated hemoglobin, where this is an example of a high VQ, so high ventilation, but basically a lower perfusion with it. What happens is, there's this would be like an example of a PE. So if you had a um, thrombus or an emboli in here, you still have normal ventilation, so they can still open, open up those alveoli, and they have um, ventilation or air going through there, but they call it a dead space because it's not getting any of this blood perfused around it. So it's obviously, if you don't get that perfusion around it, it's going to be producing, once again, un, you know, low sat saturated oxygen essentially out to the body. So my point is, is that you can have a ventilation issue or you can have a perfusion issue, or unfortunately you can even have both. Um, and usually those ventilation issues are things like COPD, um, you know, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, asthma is another one, where perfusion issues are things like a PE because you have, um, you're reducing the blood flow around there, if that makes sense. So just look at it from a ventilation and perfusion. So that's basically kind of, um, it helps you understand 
where the underlying, you know, the underlying patho with it, essentially. Um, so we look at things in terms of a lot of times you'll hear things kind of section off into restricted disorders versus obstructive disorders. Restrictive disorders are things, once again, they're restrictive, like things like pulmonary edema, atelectasis. And I'm sure everybody's heard of atelectasis, atelectasis at some point in the hospital as well. But we'll talk about this as we move through. Um, it's, at the, it's a collapsed lung at the micro level, essentially at the alveolar level, not necessarily an entire lobe or, you know, lung collapse. Um, it's not like a pneumothorax, it's more micro. Um, or you can have a pneumothorax or a pleural effusion or pneumonia. So there's things there that um, are inhibiting oxygenation, essentially, at the, you know, alveoli, essentially. Pulmonary edema is a big one that you commonly will see a lot of times in the inpatient setting. I'm sure you've seen it at some point. With pulmonary edema, obviously, it's excess fluid in the lungs. Um, it can be caused by cardiogenic, you know, reasons or non-cardiogenic. Um, cardiogenic is a very common cause, so that would be like heart failure that we kind of looked at previously. Um, so really what happens is that, um, you, you know, there's multiple mechanisms in place, like lymphatic drainage, um, that balance between hydrostatic or oncotic pressure, that um, capillary permeability. So all those factors are what kind of maintain the normal, you know, fluid status in your lungs or, or prevention of excess fluid buildup. But you could have things like obstructions, whether it's a, um, a tumor that obstructs lymphatic drainage or, um, you know, once again, like heart failure, where you start to get, lose that um, oncotic pressure there too, and they start to get um, fluid development in the lungs. Um, so really, well, obviously what it is is excess fluid in the lungs. Um, you can have other things like, and I'm sure you've probably encountered this unfortunately in the um, inpatient setting already, but things like um, acute respiratory distress syndrome or um, insult to the lung, whether, you know, it's um, a good example, like nowadays we're talking a lot about these vaping expose, um, exposure, the vaping or chemical related injuries to the lungs, and it causes this um, massive inflammatory reaction in the lungs as well, and obviously too it can lead to pulmonary edema. Um, so there can be injury there that can um, cause it. Obstruction, like I already mentioned, things like um, tumors, um, edema, once again, can kind of actually, they can kind of compound each other, unfortunately, because there's decreased lymphatic um, drainage. Um, increased systemic venous pressure, because um, what happens is it increases that hydrostatic pressure of the large pulmonary veins, um, and basically that's where the pulmonary lymph system drains, and it kind of obstructs that, and then you have a reduced, um, basically, drainage out of there. It's not draining well because of that. This is just a chart that kind of explains like if the three different mechanisms. So if you look at it from the left, valvular dysfunction, heart, um, basically coronary heart disease, left ventricular dysfunction, because remember once again these are like cardiac factors that can lead to pulmonary edema. Whereas the middle section is like more of an injury related to that capillary endothelium. So that's where they kind of get that increased permeability, and, you know, these inflammatory mediators and disruption there where they get fluid kind of shifting, um, you know, into the lungs essentially from that. Or you can have blockage of lymphatic vessels where um, they're unable to move that excess fluid from the lungs, from that interstitial space, and it doesn't drain well. So then they get a buildup of fluid in, that, um, in the interstitial space and end up with pulmonary edema. So really, like I said, it's kind of branched into three separate areas that can kind of um, cause pulmonary edema. And... Heart, the heart is definitely a very common cause, but once again, in the you know in the inpatient setting, you'll see other causes that cause um, or other um, insults that cause pulmonary edema in patients. Um, in terms of the presentation of pulmonary edema, it's those those common symptoms that you will see with respiratory dyspnea. So they often complain of very shortness of or they're very short of breath, or on exertion they may um, complain of shortness of breath, orthopnea, hypoxemia. Increased work of breathing. So, you know, they may be, have a difficult time even performing, you know, normal activities during the day um, or sleeping upright. Um, you may hear crackles when they inspire when you're listening to their lungs. And that's mainly obviously due to the fluid buildup. Dullness to percussion over the lungs. And with percussion, it's all about that fluid, or I'm sorry, about the density there. So if your lungs are tend to be more of a, a resident um, type organ in where, because it's air filled, there's a lot of, I mean, it's an organ, but there's a lot of air in it. So when you start filling it with fluid or more dense organs, you start to hear more dullness there in terms of percussion. Sometimes you will see an S3 gallop and that um, you'll see with heart enlargement and you also see that with fluid volume overload. 
Um, so you'll get into that in your assessment course as well, but it's not uncommon to hear an S3 with um, pulmonary edema. Um, other things that can cause pulmonary disease, um, and typically sometimes injuries that can cause this as well, aspiration, and I'm sure everybody's probably seen this at some point, or you know, you worry about the risk of aspiration in patients. Um, so once again, it can actually, we can have aspiration pneumonia as well, so it can kind of proceed and become even um, worse, essentially, with infection. Um, but once again, it's passage of fluid or particles into the lungs. Um, the right lobe tends to be the most frequent site because of just the structure and the anatomy of the bronchi. Um, it's straighter, basically, on that side, so it tends to kind of go to that area. So that is one area you would look at, like on chest x-ray as well. Um, but once again, we worry about aspiration pneumonia. Um, pneumonitis basically is actually like, um, it's basically an immune response, and it's a significant inflammatory response that... Um, it's actually a perfect example is like a vaping related injury. So it's exposure to like toxins essentially, and it may not necessarily be, you know, a bacteria, but you have a significant inflammatory response that, you know, causes essentially pneumonitis essentially, which is, can lead to like, you know, respiratory distress as well if it gets severe enough. Atelectasis, I'm sure everybody has heard about this, um, very, very common postoperatively in patients, which everything, you know, I'm sure as, you know, as nurses, we all have worked on um, or worked with patients that we always tell them to cough and deep breathe after um, surgeries or if they're laying in bed, um, because really it's to kind of expand those little tiny airways, your alveoli. And what happens a lot is if they're laying in bed or postoperatively, they get um, collapse of those small little airways, and they're at risk for, actually they're at greater risk for like pneumonia as well. Um, but really we worry about this postoperatively. So, you know, taking deep breaths and using those um, incentive spirometry, that's why we do all that stuff. So this is exactly why. Um, compression atelectasis versus absorption. You tend to see absorption more, um, more commonly. This is what you tend to see, you know, in a post-op patient. Um, and you see this after anesthesia, unfortunately, as well. So that's why we always make sure that we're getting our patients up and moving, um, you know, after surgery. Bronchiectasis is basically, um, it's a little bit higher up, so it's more abnormal dilatation of the bronchi. So um, once again, it's usually related to like a chronic inflammatory process um, that really leads to destruction um, of the elastic and muscular components of those walls. So it's not really at the very low area of the, um, the alveoli. It's a little bit higher up. Um, it's not your main bronchioles, but it's kind of an in-between um, the two. Um, but once again, a lot of times you'll see this with um, chronic pulmonary diseases, and it's not uncommon in like um, patients that have been on a ventilator a long time and things like that, um, you'll see it with. Um, this is absorption atelectasis. So it just puts a picture with exactly kind of what happens in those patients, you know, postoperatively that we worry about. Um, what happens if you look on the left, you know, they, they, the alveoli basically kind of shrivels up and they don't get good expansion of it. Um, or you can even see, too, there's that mucus plug there. So that's another reason why we have them cough and deep breathe. You know, we want them to clear that mucus so they get good expansion of that alveoli and basically, you know, fill those airways back up and, you know, keep them expanded, obviously to promote good um, gas exchange there. Whereas on the right, that's a, um, uh, basically taking deep breaths. So they still show that mucus plug there, but if you get it to... Um, if you get the patient to breathe in enough, you'll get it actually to kind of push through from both sides to help expand that. And actually, this is what will push up that mucus plug, you know, if you look at the image. So that's exactly why it's so important to get patients, obviously, up and um, moving around and coughing and deep breathing. Um, other things that you'll see is bronchiolitis. Um, this is super common in kids. Like, you'll see this, unfortunately, like during RSV season. RSV is respiratory syn um, syncytial virus. It's actually, in the adults, it's more of like a common cold, but in little ones, it can be detrimental. Um, what, you know, when they tend to get like an infection, it's almost like, um, it's kind of like a form of bronchitis, but it's not, it's, it's lower down than the bronchi. Because when you think about your main bronchi branching off, you know, from your trachea, those are your larger airways. Where bronchiolitis affects these airways that are just previous to your alveoli. So it's the smaller little bronchioles that you'll see right in this area. Like I said, it's very common in kids and they tend to get, you know, significant inflammation with it. They get a lot of mucus with it and they, you know, tend to cough up a lot of stuff with it. Um, it can happen in adults as well. Um, Toxic gases or some kind of um, insult to the lungs, they can develop this as well. But like I said, you tend to see it a lot in kids. 
Um, and really, I just added the image on the right just to kind of show you an image of where it tends to occur. Um, but really, these muscles around the, the little areas start to get tightened and constricted, essentially. So it's, um, you know, they have significant narrowing there between mucus production and then that smaller airway, essentially, um, leading just to those alveoli. So obviously, it can impair gas exchange in, these, in children. So they present with a lot of different signs and symptoms with it. Um, in kids, they... Little ones, you really got to think about things of like feeding intolerance, like if they're babies and, you know, they're having a difficult time taking a bottle or breastfeeding. Um, and then obviously, too, is even in the toddler, are they eating okay? Can they drink? Um, you tend to see more things like retractions and use of accessory muscles in little ones as well. Um, but this, like I said, is common in, in little ones. Um, bronchiolitis obliterans is basically more of a late stage fibrotic change. Um, this is more of a permanent um, scarring of the lungs or changes of the airways there. Um, it can occur, occur with all causes of bronchiolitis, but like I said, this is more of like a chronic late stage finding that you would see um, with progressive bronchiolitis that's, you know, chronic. Um, obviously, too, you can have pleural abnormalities. So remember the pleural or the pleura is what's lining the lungs, essentially. Um, things like a pleural effusion. Um, once again, you probably have came into contact with this in inpatient setting. Um, but you can have um, different causes of pleural effusions, more like systemic. And I just added that on the right. But you can have like a local cause, whether they had a chylothorax or a hemothorax with blood in the area. Or they could have lymphatic fluid in the area that's usually caused from like if they had an underlying tumor in the area. Um, TB can kind of um, precipitate it, um, but basically there's lymph fluid with a chylothorax, where hemothorax is blood, and a lot of times that's commonly seen with injuries or a complication of surgery with that. Um, where like a hydrothorax is more, um, it's more fluid, it's not like pus or anything like that, and a lot of times you'll see this more with like heart failure, um, kidney failure, renal failure, things like that. Empyema essentially is more of an infectious process. Basically, um, you'll see pus in this area. And you might have seen this at some point or another in the hospital setting. Um, but really, it starts from that lymphatic obstruction. And then what happens is they start to get like an infection in that area as well. Um, so it, it tends to have a lot of that purulent pus in that area, unfortunately, with it. Um, other conditions is pulmonary fibrosis. This can be, um, you see this more probably in the inpatient setting, but you might see this chronically in the outpatient setting as well. Um, but really, it's just that change in the connective tissue there where it becomes more fibrous. Um, it can be idiopathic or it can be caused from an underlying disease state that the patient previously has gone through or currently has, like ARDS or TB or inhalation of harmful substances, like a good example once again, you think about that vaping stuff that's been going on. Um, you know, this can be a long-standing side effect from it. They can have pulmonary fibrosis from it. Autoimmune disorders can um, trigger it as well. But really, it's a chronic inflammatory state or fibroproliferative state that causes um, or changes that interstitial lung tissue, basically by the alveoli. So what happens essentially is they get, um, you know, the inability to, or they still have the ability, but they have a reduced capacity to um, have that gas exchange occur efficiently. Um, so they're at more risk for hypoxemia, essentially. Um, and they also end up with, like, decreased lung compliance. So they have a harder time breathing, and they um, tend to have more, of, you know, or basically hypoventilation with it because they don't get good expansion with it anymore because of these long-standing fibrotic changes that can occur. Um, but once again, they end up with, like, a decreased tidal volume or hypercapnia because of it. Um, you know, so obviously this is a chronic issue that can um, occur. But it's usually related to an underlying condition that they've had previously. So there's usually a history there. Um, chest wall restrictions is actually fairly common. And you've got to think about this from the perspective of even patients that are obese. Um, it impedes, you know, the good um, expansion of the chest wall. If you have, you know, decreased expansion, and it's definitely going to affect your, um, your oxygenation and all that and your gas exchange. Another big one that... Um, you think of as kyphosis in the older adult. You know, with kyphosis, usually it's related to osteoporosis. Um, they have that change in curvature of the upper thoracic spine. Well, they don't get great lung expansion because of it. Another one is scoliosis. If you have severe scoliosis, it can affect lung expansion as well. Neuromuscular diseases are a big one, like ALS, things like that can um, obviously affect um, chest wall expansion. Um, and once again, ventilation can be compromised because of that 
decreased tidal volume. So when I say decreased tidal volume, it's basically the inability or the ability to increase the volume of the chest essentially with it. Um, so treatment obviously is to reverse the underlying cause or we try our best to prevent, you know, things like kyphosis or scoliosis or try to treat the underlying process with it. Um, other inhalation disorders, kind of similar to what I mentioned too about inhal inhalation of toxic gases or toxic substances. Um, you may, this is more of a, you might see this more in the inpatient, set, inpatient setting. Um, pneumoconosis essentially is related to exposure once again. So that's when you need to take a good history on your patient's, you know, line of work, what they have been exposed to. If they have a new onset of, um, you know, dyspnea, or shortness of breath, essentially, um, you know, or decreased oxygenation. These are things you want to inquire about. What do they do for work? Have they been exposed to anything? Because obviously things can lead to um, inflammation into the lungs or scarring in the area in the areas of the lungs, or they can develop pul pulmonary fibrosis from it, um, or even things like asbestos, like you've heard about mesothelioma or development of cancer or tumors. Unfortunately, um, when there's exposure to it. Um, allergic alveolitis essentially is another, um, very similar to like an, um, it's similar to like the exposure to toxic gases, but it's usually related to an allergen, but it, they're very small allergens. So it could be like a tiny dust particle. Um, but what happens is it, it basically prompts this hypersensitivity reaction. And remember when we talk about that, that's where all those inflammatory meteors can kind of come on, um, and that's why they start to get all that, um, you know, inflammatory response and the swelling in, you know, mucus production and all that um, in the airways, essentially, because it's all related to that hypersensitivity reaction. Um, and it goes back to, like, your IgG antibody production. So it's related to an allergen, but usually it's a small, tiny little allergen, um, and the body has an over-exaggerated response to it, essentially. But then they present with pulmonary symptoms because of it. I'm going to go ahead and put this on a separate lecture um, just to separate obstructive out, and I think it'll kind of separate it better if we kind of um, look at it from um, perspective of obstructive versus restrictive. Um, so go ahead and proceed with the next one when you have a moment. Thank you.